It's fair to say we do live in extraordinarily exciting times. The year 2017 has been a major year of anniversaries in the recent history of the nation of Israel. 2018 promises for as long as we are here to be another major anniversary in this nation's history. We might suggest that we're starting to see the fig tree and all the trees. When they now shoot forth, ye see and know of your own selves that summer is now nigh at hand. So likewise, when ye see these things come to pass, know that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. So, as we say, a major year of anniversaries. We don't have the time to go through all of these this evening, but 2017, it's been 120 years, hasn't it, since Theodore Herzl first convened the, the first Zionist Congress in Basel in 1897. And of course, young people, just a reminder to you that that was where there was the great movement for the Jewish people to have a homeland. You, if, if you want to do some research, go and have a look at Theodore Herzl and the events around him. 1917, 100 years since the Balfour Declaration. So significant because Isaiah chapter 60 said that Tarshish would bring Israel's sons from afar. And so the Jewish people thank Israel, uh, Britain still today for the role that Britain played in bringing the Jewish people back to their land. Brother Thomas, of course, as Christadelphians we know, had written in Elpis Israel in 1848 that it would be Tarshish, the British maritime power, that would bring Israel, the Jewish people, back to the land of Israel. And a hundred years after Elpis Israel was written, in 1848, in 1948, that state of Israel was declared. Seventy years since the adoption of the UN partition plan, that would lead to a resolution on the forming of the state of Israel. Seventy years since the finding of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Fifty years since the reunification of Jerusalem, following the Six-Day War in 1967. We just want to quickly start with the Dead Sea Scrolls. We remember the story, right, of the shepherd boy in the desert in Qumran throwing stones up into the hills. And of course, boys, you'll understand this, right? He's chucking these stones and he's expecting the familiar sound of stone on rock and something different comes back, echoing out of the cave. Because he smashed a vase. And when he climbs up, he discovers what were later found to be these amazing scrolls, dating back long before the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, demonstrating that the prophecies in Isaiah were written before Jesus was born. And so though before this time people could say, well, I appreciate that Isaiah is extraordinarily accurate, but it must have been written after Jesus was born. These scrolls prove that wasn't the case. And Isaiah was the great scroll. And I want you to imagine living in 1947. For some of you, it's probably not so difficult, right? <laughs> Apologies. Is that, is that a bit harsh? I, I, should I say sorry? Um, well, you will know, and you will be able to tell these young people particularly, tell me, what it was like living in a Christadelphian home at that time. As mums and dads, as grannies and grandpas, excitedly talked around the meal tables about the events taking place in Israel. And in this year, the great Isaiah scroll has been found. In this year too, the United Nations set up a partition plan. Here it is on our screen, which shows us in red the, 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 the portion in Palestine that was going to be for the Arabs and in green for the Jewish people. And so in 1948, the State of Israel was able to be declared. What you may not know is that 
in 1948, the UN launched its UDHR. The UDHR. What's the UDHR? The Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And so on the 10th of December this year, in 2017, it's an anniversary year. From the 10th of December, just gone, until the 10th of December 2018, special events are being held to celebrate this historic document, the UDHR, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And so we read in this article, the United Nations on Sunday of December the 10th kicked off in Paris, France, a year-long campaign to honour the foundational human rights document, which next year makes its 70th anniversary. And it was written by a man called René Cassin. I, too, took French in school. <laughs> and René Cassin is described as the father of the Declaration of Human Rights. I just want you to note this, that here is this Frenchman. Interestingly, he was a Jew. Here is a Frenchman, French Jew, in 1947, after the events of the Second World War, working, 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 this brilliant brain, this lawyer, René Cassin, to draw up this famous document. And we read uh, in, in this particular article of what René Cassin did. We read René Cassin played a decisive role in drawing up the 1948 Declaration. Let me read the part in bold at the bottom there. That René Cassin presented a preliminary draft on the 16th of June which was adopted as a working basis. It can be seen that his preliminary draft included the entire contents of the 1789 French Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen. What happened in 1789? Come on, shout it out for me. The French Revolution, right? So this Frenchman writes the UDHR, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, based entirely on 1789 on the French Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen. That is a major anniversary this year. And in 1948, the State of Israel was declared. Let's see if we can play this. Brother Thomas wrote in Elpis Israel, when this happens, when Israel is brought back to the land, when this is accomplished to the required extent, he writes, it becomes a notable sign of the times. Isn't that a brilliant understatement? A notable sign of the times? Israel is back in the land. And what have we seen since? Well, in that 70-year period, we've seen the population of Jewish people in the land grow year on year. Uh, in, in the red here, we of course see the population explosion 
1948, 49, 50. In 1990, we see another explosion. Why might that be? Russia. The collapse of the USSR. And so once again, many, many Jews came from the north back to the land of Israel. In 67, we saw Israel take considerably more land than the UN partition plan of 1947. And so Israel took a huge amount of this land, including particularly of great interest to us, the West Bank, Jerusalem, the mountains of Israel. Rebecca and I were extremely well blessed to be able to go and visit Israel just a couple of months or so ago. And one of the things that is so extraordinary when you're in that land is the stretch of the mountains just to the east of Jerusalem, stretching right up through the land, the West Bank Territory, the mountains of Israel. And we're interested in it because of the reading we just took. Open your Bibles, if they're not already there, to Ezekiel chapter 36. We read that Ezekiel is asked to prophesy, verse 1, to the mountains of Israel. So young people, that might as well say, prophesy to the West Bank, right? That is the mountains of Israel. And what is this prophecy going to say? We read verse 8. But ye, O mountains of Israel, ye shall shoot forth your branches. Well, there's the fig tree language, isn't it? Yield your fruit to my people of Israel, for they are at hand to come. Behold, I am for you, and I will turn unto you, and ye shall be tilled and sown. And I will multiply men on you. All the house of Israel, even all of it, and the city shall be inhabited, and the waste places shall be wilted. I will multiply on you man and beast, and they shall increase and bring fruit. And I will settle you after your old estates. I will do better unto you than at your beginnings. Then you shall know that I am Yahweh. So what do we read? That on the mountains of Israel, men are going to be multiplied. And that's exactly what we have seen in the last 50 years since 1967. We read in verse 11, I will settle you. Here's an example of an Israeli settlement on the West Bank. It's just interesting to note that Brother Thomas in Eureka wrote, it may be remarked here, that there will have been a considerable gathering of Israelites upon the mountains of Israel before the invasion of the country by Gog. Brethren and sisters, young people, that is what we've seen. This graph shows to us the settler population in the West Bank. I will multiply men on you. This graph shows us the red line is the, uh, the, the settler population of uh, all, all the way through the land of Israel. The blue line is the West Bank. It's the greatest growth. I will multiply men on you. Just have a look at this chart. So from 67 to 2016, I will multiply men upon you. What does the world think about the growing population, the settlements being built continually on the West Bank, in what the world would say are occupied territories by Israel? Well, the organization Human Rights Watch says that 50 years of occupation abuses. They write, 50 years after Israel occupied the West Bank and Gaza Strip, it controls these areas through repression, institutionalized discrimination, and systematic abuses of the Palestinian population's rights, Human Rights Watch said today. At least five categories 
of major violations of international human rights law and humanitarian law characterise the occupation. So the world looks on at what Israel is doing, at their actions in the land. And the world says that you are violating international human rights law. The United Nations just recently declares Israel as having the world's worst record on human rights. Now just think about that. Think about some of the regimes we know across the world. Think about states, rogue states in Africa. Think about the challenging states in the Middle East. Syria, Iran. Think further east, North Korea and the like. Israel, the United Nations says, has the world's worst human rights record. And so... Brethren and sisters, young people, we skip to one year ago yesterday. Because one year ago yesterday, on the 24th of December, 2016, the United Nations voted. And one of the last things that Barack Obama did in office was to allow this vote to pass through the UN Security Council. So when the United Nations young people, particularly for you, uh, vote within the General Assembly, it's non-binding. So the General Assembly can have a vote on something, and what they decide, frankly, is irrelevant. Because if someone in the world doesn't want to do it, it's a non-binding uh, legal agreement. When the UN Security Council votes, it's legally, under international law, binding. But for the UN Security Council to pass something, all of the key members, the permanent members of the UN Security Council, of which there are five, have to agree or at least not disagree. If they're prepared to abstain from a vote, then the vote can pass. Whereas if they vote against, it cannot pass. And on this particular historic day, Barack Obama abstained from the vote. And the United States, which for decades in their policy had stood by Israel, abstained on this vote. And so, Resolution 2334 was passed. And UN Resolution 2334 is an extraordinary United Nations resolution. It says, we condemn all measures aimed at altering the demographic composition, character and status of the Palestinian territory since 1967, including East Jerusalem, the construction and expansion of settlements transfer of Israeli settlers. What do they say? It's violation, in violation of international humanitarian law and other relevant resolutions. The resolution reaffirms that the establishment by Israel of settlements in the Palestinian territory occupied since 1967, including East Jerusalem, has no legal validity and constitutes a flagrant violation under international law. It reiterates its demand that Israel immediately and completely cease all settlement activity in the occupied Palestinian territory. The resolution calls upon all states to uphold this resolution, to hold Israel to account, to international law, to UN Resolution 233. Three, four. And brethren and sisters and young people, we're interested, aren't we? When we read a UN resolution that calls upon all states, surely our minds start to go to Revelation chapter 16. We shall go there shortly. But in that chapter we know, don't we, 
that the kings of all the earth and the whole world are called to battle. Israel's settlements, the UN say, have no legal validity. The settlement activity constituted the single biggest threat to peace, they say. And there are five major settlements in the West Bank territories uh, and, and in East Jerusalem. Actually, there are over half a million people in uh, the occupied territories, as the world calls them, uh, Israeli people. But what's happened since? Were Israel worried? Did Israel stop building their settlements? Did the prophecy of Ezekiel 36 suddenly stop? Far from it. Because as Barack Obama left the White House, in marched Donald Trump, right? And this man, as Brother Roger rightly told us this afternoon, it is God who rules in the kingdoms of men and puts he, in charge who, whomsoever he will. And he chose to put Barack, Donald Trump into the White House for a reason. And we've seen this year a major part of that reason because of his support despite his character for the nation of Israel. And so they've kept building. The settlements keep coming. New Israeli settlements in the West Bank only show the UN's inaptitude to act. The settler population growth rate twice more than inside Israel. And many of you will have come across by now Nikki Haley, the, the US ambassador appointed by Trump to the United Nations. And Nikki Haley in February of 2017 went to her first visit of the UN Security Council. And after that visit, she gave a press conference. Now I'm hoping we'll be able to hear this. We'll put it on shortly. Uh, if we can't, then I'll tell you what it says, uh, what she said afterwards. Good morning. Um, first of all, as this is the first time I have dealt with this press corps, um, I just want to say that I hope that we can have a lot more conversations and um, continue to do these types of things. Um, but I'll ask that I will respect you if you'll respect me. So as we develop this relationship, um, we'll see how it goes. So the first thing I want to do is talk about what we just um, saw in there. The Security Council just finished its regular monthly meeting on Middle East issues. It's the first meeting like that that I've attended, and I have to say it was a bit strange. The Security Council is supposed to discuss how to maintain international peace and security. But at our meeting on the Middle East, the discussion was not about Hezbollah's illegal buildup of rockets in Lebanon. It was not about the money and weapons Iran provides to terrorists. It was not about how we defeat ISIS. It was not about how we hold Bashar al-Assad accountable for the slaughter of hundreds and thousands of civilians. No, instead the meeting focused on criticizing Israel, the one true democracy in the Middle East. I am new around here, but I understand that's how the council has operated month after month for decades. I'm here to say the United States will not turn a blind eye to this anymore. I am here to underscore the ironclad support of the United States for Israel. I'm here to emphasize the United States is determined to stand up to the UN's anti-Israel bias. We will never repeat the terrible mistake of Resolution 2334 and allow one-sided Security Council resolutions to condemn Israel too uh, easy to hear. Apologies uh, for, for our sound, but what she's saying is I went to this Security Council resolution and I couldn't believe my ears because instead of discussing all the nightmare regimes across the world, we didn't even mention them. The only thing that we talked about was Israel. And so she goes on to say of the concern that she and the United States has about the UN's bias towards the nation of Israel. How right she is. And so reports keep going back to the UN that, that Israel continues to violate Security Council uh, Resolution 2334. That report said, 
we're concerned that it's bringing things closer to the brink of an all-out confrontation. Nikki Haley goes on to address the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva to talk of her concerns about the UN Human Rights Council's problem with Israel. She says it's essential that this council addresses its chronic anti-Israel bias. The UN bullies Israel, Haley tells Netanyahu on her visit to Jerusalem in the summer. She note, was obviously tr treated as a great heroine when she came in to Jerusalem. And Netanyahu and Haley discussed that the US would try to support Israel in scrapping UN Resolution 2334. What keeps happening in the land? Emboldened by Trump, they keep building. According to an official Israeli statistics, the period between April 2016 and March 2017 saw a 70% increase in settlement housing construction in the occupied West Bank. I will multiply men upon you, all the house of Israel, even all of it. I will multiply upon you. Brethren and sisters, young people, we live in extraordinary times. And in September of this year, Netanyahu addressed the United Nations. And unfortunately, when it comes to um, UN decisions about Israel, that simple recognition is too often absent. It was absent last December when the Security Council passed an anti-Israel resolution that set back the cause of peace. It was absent last May when the World Health Organization adopted, you have to listen to this, the World Health Organization adopted a Syrian-sponsored resolution that criticized Israel for health conditions on the Golan Heights. As the great John McEnroe would say, you cannot be serious. I mean, this is preposterous. Syria has barrel bombed, starved, gassed, and murdered hundreds of thousands of its own citizens and wounded millions more, while Israel has provided life-saving medical care to thousands of Syrian victims of that very same carnage. Yet who does the World Health Organization criticize? Israel. So is there no limit to the UN's absurdities when it comes to Israel? Well, apparently not. Because in July, UNESCO declared the Tomb of the Patriarchs in Hebron a Palestinian World Heritage Site. That's worse than fake news. That's fake history. Mind you, it's true that Abraham, the father of both Ishmael and Isaac, is buried there. But so too are Isaac, Jacob, Sarah, Rebecca, Sarah is a Jewish name by the way, Sarah, Rebecca, and Leah, who just happen to be patriarchs and matriarchs of the Jewish people. Well, you won't read about that in the latest UNESCO report, but if you want to, you can read about it in a somewhat weightier publication. It's called The Bible. I highly recommend it. I hear it even got four and a half out of five stars on Amazon. And it's a great read. I read it every week. Isn't that extraordinary? Right? Now just think about that. Where is he giving those words? He's in the UN building. He's in the United Nations building in New York. And he's addressing the world. Come to Isaiah chapter 43. He tells the world to read the Bible. Isaiah 43, verse 9. 
Where is he giving that speech? Let all the nations be gathered together. Let the people be assembled in the United Nations General Assembly building. Who among them can declare this and show us former things? Let them bring forth their witnesses that they may hear, be justified, or let them hear and say it's truth. You are my witnesses, says Yahweh, my servant whom I've chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am Yahweh. Beside me there is no saviour. Isn't that extraordinary? That the angels have worked to put that man in the UN building when all the nations are gathered together and all the people assemble. And he says, open your Bibles to see what history tells you about the nation of Israel. And then, Brother Steve is going to be delighted. In December, this happens. That Trump goes ahead with his election manifesto and despite the fact that presidents before him on numerous occasions had said before they were elected we will we'll take the Jewish vote we will move the Jewish the, the American embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem once they got to office they didn't do it this man has rather ripped up the rule book and in December just a couple of weeks ago, told the world, didn't he, that he was going to move the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem because, he said, Jerusalem is Israel's capital. And naturally, we've seen, haven't we, it has sparked outrage. Trump Jerusalem move sparks Israeli Palestinian clashes. Muslim nations urge recognition of East Jerusalem as the Palestinian capital. And what goes on in the UN? The United Nations position on Jerusalem is unchanged. The special coordinator stresses a Security Council debates United States recognition of this city. We'll see what the sound is like uh, on Nikki Haley's speech to the UN on this. In this meeting, I will not use Council's time to address where a sovereign nation might decide to put its embassy and why we have every right to do so. I will address a more appropriate and urgent concern. This week marks the one-year anniversary of the passage of Resolution 2334. On that day in this Council in December 2016, the United States elected to abstain allowing the measure to pass. Now it's one year and a new administration later. Given the chance to vote again on Resolution 2334, I can say with complete confidence that the United States would vote no. We would exercise our veto power. The reasons why are very relevant to the cause of peace in the Middle East. On the surface, Resolution 2334 described Israeli settlements as impediments to peace. Reasonable people can disagree about that. And in fact, over the years, the United States has expressed criticism of Israeli settlement policies many times. But in truth, it was Resolution 2334 itself that was an impediment to peace. This Security Council put the negotiations between the Israelis and the Palestinians further out of reach by injecting itself yet again in between the two parties to the conflict. Move on. And so we need to understand what the world is talking about when they continue to say that the UN, that, the, that Israel is violating international law, is going against international human rights law, is violating these resolutions passed in the United Nations 
Security Council. What does it mean? Well, if you go onto the UN website, you can see in their history a history of their law. And you won't be surprised to read that within that article is this paragraph. The traditional categorization of three generations of human rights used in both national and international human rights discourse traces the chronological evolution of human rights as an echo to the cry of the French Revolution. Liberty, equality, and fraternity. We're not in the least bit surprised. Because who wrote the UDHR, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights? René Cassin. And René Cassin openly told the world, I've written it on the 1789 Declaration of the Rights of Man. Why is that so interesting, young people, brethren and sisters? Because in Revelation chapter 16, Christadelphians, Bible students, for many, many hundreds of years, have thought that the frog-like spirits are the spirits of the French democracy. So Brother Thomas, in 1848, said, I shall be able to convince the reader, and he brings evidence for it, that the frogs are the symbol of the French democracy. We were in France in the summer, and we saw the museum, Sam and Jemima and, and, and Beck, where those banners fly, the frogs, showing the history of the French nation from the Middle Ages. And we're interested to see that in Europe at the moment, someone is starting to take centre stage. The Economist wrote this article in September. The spotlight shifts from Germany the great powerhouse in Europe, to France. Spiegel, which is Der Spiegel, which is a German publication. Merkel should follow Macron's lead on Europe. Emmanuel Macron warns European leaders they have one year to reform the bloc. And what does he talk about that needs to be part of this reformation this year? There needs to be, he says, a European army. He's holding fast to the mantra of Europe, ever closer union. He's trying to bind Europe together. Time magazine, front page, the next leader of Europe. Just last week, a week ago today, how France's president made his mark on the world stage. What does the article say? President Macron has spoken a lot about the need to boost French influence and in standing in the world. The, the, the writer goes to say, I think Macron has a chance to appear as the leader of the free world. France alone cannot do everything, but if we look at his speech to the UN General Assembly, this speech was completely focused on human rights. The frog-like spirits. As the world looks on in fury at the actions and words of Donald Trump, they want a leader. And many eyes are turning to Europe, to France, to Macron. He visited the Council of Europe the end of October, and gave this speech. He said, France's commitment, here he is speaking in the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg, France's commitment to the principles enshrined in this convention goes back a long way. The Declaration of the Rights of Man of the Citizen of 1789 is, of course, the main wellspring of those principles. However, its roots lie even deeper in the ground of Renaissance humanism, in the legacy of antiquity, in the concept of the human being that France has constructed over the centuries. 
alongside, the, alongside those of freedom, emancipation and education. The human rights proclaimed during the French Re Revolution, then subsequently reaffirmed time and again and reinterpreted by the great minds and statesmen of our country, are an integral part of this core identity which goes back a very long way. It is not insignificant that the UDHR, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, was adopted in Paris in 1948. Nor is it a coincidence that a French city, Strasbourg, is today your home. Rest assured that for us, the French, this is of the utmost significance. Isn't it amazing? When we think about these events, next to passages like Revelation 16, just quickly turn there. We've been there a couple of times already, haven't we? I perhaps ought to give a promise that in tomorrow's talk we won't go to Revelation 16. But we do need to here. Because we understand, don't we, that at this point in history, when the Ottoman Empire has dried up, we read in Ezekiel 38 that when Israel is back in the land, at this point in history, we see three unclean spirits, verse 13, like frogs, come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. And they are the spirits of devils which go forth the kings of the whole earth, the whole world, to gather them to battle of that great day of God Almighty. And he gathered them together in a place which is in the Hebrew tongue called Armageddon. Where's Armageddon? Well, we know, don't we? Joel chapter 3 tells us, in those days, in that time, when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations and bring them down into the valley of judgment the valley of Jehoshaphat. And the chapter goes on to describe the judgment, the threshing that will take place, the heap of sheaves in the valley of threshing, when the nations of the world are gathered to Armageddon. And of course, as Christadelphians, we're so excited, aren't we? Because prophecies like Zechariah chapter 12 come jumping off the page. Behold, before the Lord comes, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling to all people round about. When they shall be in the siege, both against Judah and against Jerusalem, in that day will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. Though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. I think it's fair to say we're starting to see the world looking carefully on at Jerusalem. The frog-like spirits have gone out. When Trump made that announcement, the United Nations, the European Union, and the Pope criticize Trump's Jerusalem announcement. The New York Times headline is, it could read, the UN, the head of the frog-like spirits, the beast, and the false prophet criticise Trump's Jerusalem announcement. Pope Francis urges world leaders to respect the UN position. Can we see what's happening? The UN position is based on the UDHR, right? Do you see? The UN position is entirely based upon this human rights, on international law. This is coming out of the mouth of the false prophet. It's coming out of the mouth of the dragon. Putin, deeply concerned by Trump's Jerusalem move, he added that Moscow believes that the status of Jerusalem should be settled through talks between the Palestinians and Israel in line with the frog-like spirits. 
And so the Russian Federation, the Dragon, gave their speech just this week to the UN. In Moscow, the decision announced in Washington was greeted with serious concern. We are of the view that a fair and reliable settlement of the long-standing Palestinian-Israeli conflict should be reached on the well-known basis of international law, including the corresponding resolutions of the Security Council and the General Assembly of the United Nations. We'll leave him, right? Uh, uh, but needless to say, I hope he just, just about picks up what he's saying, that is that they believe that the Jerusalem issue should be dealt with by the U UN in the General Assembly under international law. It's coming out of the mouth of the dragon. There's one more video. We'll try one more and uh, see how we go. Rivolgere un accurato appello affinché sia impegno di tutti a rispettare lo status quo della città in conformità con le pertinenti risoluzioni delle Nazioni Unite. And we've always regarded Jerusalem uh, as a final status issue that must be resolved through direct negotiations between the two parties based on relevant Security Council resolutions. The European Union supports the resumption of a meaningful peace process towards a two-state solution. We believe that any action that would undermine these efforts must absolutely be avoided. Do you see? You look in the news at the moment out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, out of the mouth of the false prophet, are coming the frog-like spirits as they declare to all the world to look in on Jerusalem. Surely, brethren and sisters, young people, these signs in the times are telling us that we need to be ready. Francis Macron regrets Trump's unilateral Jerusalem decision. He says, because he speaks no longer simply for France, France and Europe are attached to the UN decision. So here we are again. Revelation 16, verse 15. Behold, I come as a thief. When these things are happening in the world, watch out, brethren and sisters, young people. The Lord will suddenly come. Do you know, we don't know the day or the hour. We have no idea the exact time when the Lord Jesus Christ will come back to the earth. But we do know this. No further prophecies need to be fulfilled before we could be called away to the judgment seat. And so we challenge ourselves this week. We challenge ourselves tonight. Are we ensuring that we're keeping our garments? Lest we walk naked and the Lord God sees our shame. Let's ensure, in the days that remain, before the Lord does come, we're watching. We're a people prepared for his coming.